Welcome to the Research Reimagine podcast, brought to you by Nottingham Trent University. I'm your host, Helen Darby Dowman, and I'll be inviting some of NTU's brightest minds to explore how their research is helping us to deepen our understanding of the world. From online addictions to transgender rights and sleep disorders, listen as we discuss some of society's most pressing challenges and uncover some of the ways our research is making a difference. Last year, Nottingham Trent University, along with the University of Nottingham, under the Universities for Nottingham Partnership, launched a revolutionary new project. Over the next eight years, the Collaboratory Initiative will bring together researchers, community organisations and local people to deliver meaningful change for the people of Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. By training PhD students and citizen scientists, this innovative project will support the local area by improving the well-being and welfare of residents and community. To find out more about this groundbreaking new venture and why it's so important to the people of Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, I'm joined today by Rebecca smith McGloin, Director of Doctoral School and Research Operations at NTU, and Matthew Young, Co-Laboratory Doctoral Programme Manager. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Can you share with me why this initiative is so unique? Co-laboratory is sort of built on and around the Universities for Nottingham initiative and Universities for Nottingham are passionate advocates for the local area. It's really around a shared mission to improve levels of prosperity and health and well-being for residents of the local community in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. Um, And so co-laboratory is really about what happens when we bring um, PhD projects and a doctoral programme into a civic engagement space and how might we do doctoral research differently so that it meets the needs of uh, local residents and the local community. And by doing that, um, we're able hopefully to get um, local people involved in doctoral research for the first time because the projects that we um, uh, that we'll do as part of co-laboratory have a relevance and a resonance for the people of Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. Yeah, it's it's very much about completely uh, reimagining the research process. So for those who aren't familiar with research, normally when these projects are being developed, a couple of academics, maybe from different institutions, but within the same subject area, roughly, they come together, they discuss their ideas based on kind of previous literature and what they know to be kind of the current basis of understanding. And they say, right, here's what we think might solve the problem we're talking about. And then they go ahead and uh, try and establish a research project, get a PhD student or two, and then they try and um, undertake that, explore it, pull it apart, and try and solve the problems. But what we're trying to do with co-laboratory is we are trying to bring members of the local community into that process so that they have a say in what the starting point actually is and they get to tell us you know what actually is the relevant um, issues that they are facing which research can try and tackle and that's really the basis of the whole program of co-laboratory and we really trying to we're trying to feed that into every step of the way. So can you tell me a little bit about the recruitment then that you, process that you're going through and how maybe that varies compared to the traditional? Sure um, Rebecca do you maybe want to say how it normally happens and then I can say how we're trying to do it? Okay so um PhD recruitment is usually very much focused on the degree classification that you got. So did you get a 2-2 or a 2-1 or a first in your undergraduate degree Um, and uh, what university you went to to do that? Um, And so this really filters out a large part of the population because you need to have completed an undergraduate degree and you need to have got um, either a 2-1 or a 1st. And ideally, um, uh, universities are usually looking for um, applicants to have undertaken some kind of small research project as part of their undergraduate degree. So what that means is um, if you... um, if you didn't do brilliantly in your A-levels, if you ended up going to um, uh, um, not the university that you wanted to go to, if you didn't get the degree classification that you wanted, you're set off on a completely different um, track and and you it's very, very hard for you to come back into research. So you could be an ideal candidate for a particular PhD project because you have extensive real world experience of working in a particular area, but you're you're automatically filtered out because you don't have the academic qualifications. But those academic qualifications are historical, so they're looking backwards at what you manage to achieve, which is often um, uh, sort of shaped by life experiences, things that happened to you where you grew up. 
What we're trying to do in CoLab is something that's much more future facing and much more focused on potential and the experiences that you could have had in a lot of different contexts, which demonstrate that you, you have a PhD in you and you can undertake PhD research, not by what kind of degree you got, but by the sort of the wealth of everything that you are and that you can bring to the PhD. Yeah. So with that in mind, what we're trying to do with Collaboratory is we're trying to open this, our recruitment process up to a broader range of people. So it's well known. There's a lot of evidence for it that, you know, a more diverse workforce, more diverse research force brings more innovation, more mix of ideas. And that's what uh, a large part of the higher education sector has been trying to push for and innovate towards for quite a while now. However, what we've learned, and I say we as in the broader sense, not us specifically, um, we're learning from a lot of other people's lessons in this, but what we know now is that there are a lot of barriers within academia that stops these diverse, more diverse kind of people coming into academia. So for instance, uh, Rebecca mentioned that, you know, it, it's an issue if you've been out of academia for a while, it's very difficult to get back in because academia can become a very um, niche bubble in itself. And if you're not really in that bubble and you don't intimately know the ways of thinking and doing things, it doesn't mean that you don't have the skills. It doesn't mean that you don't have the potential, but you just don't know kind of the way it's expected for you to present information. It's not really familiar with you how you're meant to um, break down certain ideas and concepts. And so what we're trying to do with Co Laboratories recruitment process is we're, we're basically um, starting it from scratch. Um, we're actually have been in the middle of, we've actually just been in the middle of it right now. Um, with our last interviews later today. And it's been very different for all the academics who've been involved with us where we're doing exactly what Rebecca says. We have created a framework that really looks at candidates' potential. It looks at their transferable skills that they've picked up from all other areas of work and life. And it looks at how their understanding of uh, local communities and the relevant issues that are being explored through the research uh, sub through the research projects available are going to help them become the best researcher for that project as possible. Obviously, you just mentioned talking about local people, local issues and how that supports our communities. Can you tell me why it's so important for the people of Nottingham to get well for these projects to be able to give back to people of Nottingham? Well, there's firstly, we've got two huge universities sitting in our city here, um, which is really fantastic. Universities uh, bring a lot to the city. But there is also that dichotomy where we have a lot of people who live and work in Nottingham who've probably never even been to the uni either of the universities, who've never interacted with us. And universities can't just be these large, uh, very sometimes domineering institutions that sit within a community and take over. We're a part of the community. The people who work here, we are part of the wider community itself. And so this speaks to the broader uh, social responsibilities of the university. And so it's really important um, for the university to make sure that um, local people are reflected in the work that we do. Um, local people uh, in our area, they're going to have a more intimate understanding of the issues at play when we are doing place-based research, like uh, we're supporting with this program. And um, yeah, they're going to help us enrich our community as a whole. Why is there a need for PhD projects uh, which focus on such local issues? What we've encountered is um, a research agenda at university level, but at sector level as well, that is set by um, uh, researchers in those universities. Um, but actually the universities are a huge untapped resource in the city and the county and the region where they sit. So trying to um, uh, kind of develop a place-based research agenda more through a PhD um, uh, program like this is starting to chip away at some of the barriers that have existed, um, which have kind of, um, they've, they've impeded the potential of universities to um, address some of the most challenging um, problems that are faced locally. Um, so we have this great resource um, and if we can bring together the local community, uh, citizens of uh, Nottingham City and County with this untapped resource, um, then we can um, uh, sort of 
um, we can address many of the issues um, uh, around prosperity, health, well-being um, that, that we know um, are faced by uh, people in the East Midlands. Yeah, and there's also um, another kind of layer to that which we're trying to address, which is the, the need for more local specific insights to some of these issues. So, you know, research to a large extent exists to try and help people, help wider society, help solve the problems that we face. But um, without that specific insight from people who have lived experience of those specific issues, particularly if you're doing it uh, research based on, you know, what people in a certain area are facing, if you conduct that research without the, the voice of those who it affects, then there's a high chance that the outcomes of that research is not going to be as effective. They're not going to be able to be applied and make the difference that you want to. And also, even if you're researching the same uh, topic, if you're researching crime, for instance, here in Nottingham versus, um, I don't know, here in London, the picture is going to be very different. And um, while you may learn a lot of useful lessons, um, there's going to be a lot that isn't transferable and that is going to be in informed quite a lot by the specific culture of that city, that region, the people, the communities involved. And so uh, really, that's why there's this big need for place-based research. Can you tell us about some of the proposed projects um, and how these have been decided and how they're going to help the local communities? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the way we've created all of these projects is we, rather than the typical academic process where we just kind of say, we're open for submissions, academics, please send us your ideas. We ran a whole series of talks and workshops and meetings where we brought academics and members of the local communities who work at very community focused organizations, such as uh, the local councils, NHS bodies, and other um, voluntary sector charities, that kind of thing. We brought them all together and we got them all working together in discussion groups to say, right, what is it that is really important to local people, particularly the people who access the services of some of these organizations? And from there, that's where they created some of these research projects. So everything was based on uh, people's current understanding of the needs of local communities. And we've come up with amazing projects uh, for our first year. We've got 17 that went out to advertisement. And I'll give you an example of a few of them. So uh, this one here is called Understanding and Responding to Youth Violence, Blending Data Science with Lived Experience. This is a really interesting project, um, which is being done in conjunction uh, with the Violence Reduction Unit, uh, which is linked to policing. And um, what they're doing is basically taking um, a lot of really big data approaches, which are now coming in uh, to use across policing, but they really want to have a community-focused, community-led approach to this so that um, we can uh, make sure that the interventions that they develop are going to be relevant to the communities, but also that we can try and avoid some key issues which keep cropping up when we think about face recognition software and the use of algorithms. Um, there's a lot of issues around race and bias that come into these. And so what they want to do is find a good way to be able to use this data to help communities by including the voice of these communities. We've also got a um, interesting project, a uh, very different take, um, look, which is called Boxing in the Community, Moving Beyond the Myths of Sports Positive Potentials to Reduce Violence. And this project is working with a local youth group that provides boxing coaching um, to young people. And very often these are young people who have um, come from difficult backgrounds. They've maybe experienced violence uh, or criminal activity in some form. And they're a lot of them are vulnerable young people. And so this project is basically understanding what it is that these young people get from um, this boxing program and how the lessons uh, that these young people take away from this can be extrapolated to their wider community so we can understand what it is about it that helps benefit these uh, folks, how we can reduce uh, violent crime through um, issues sorry, through programs like this. And then finally, we've got um, another project uh, which is called, what does it mean to be work ready, investigating the education to employment transition for young people in former coalfields areas? So this one takes a step out of the city center and works in the Mansfield and Ashfield areas. Um, and it's basically looking at issues of um, unemployment and uh, low educational attainment in that area, where there's a whole host of structural issues that have, have led to this being the case today. And it's working with local authorities and educational partnerships to understand, right, for these folks specifically in this area, what will help them 
take that step from education to the end of school into employment afterwards and uh, to really understand that picture locally and very specifically and and what we can do to inform future policy and other uh, broader structural changes. So a lot of these projects have obviously come from working in partnership with community, um, well, community-based partners. Can you tell me a bit about the benefits of bringing those community-based partners on board uh, to create these projects? Yeah, so um, as Matt was talking then and describing some of the projects, I was just reflecting on the nature of the projects that co-laboratory has generated is uh, they're very much community facing and they're talking about building trust with the community, increasing participation from the community, um, um, having a community informed approach to um, addressing particular challenges, violence reduction, things like that. Um, So I think there's something unique about the approach that develops projects that are, it's not just around um, increasing access and participation into the doctorate by local people, but it's actually the nature, the, 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 the kind of DNA of the research that is surfaced through this process is participatory in its in its nature. And, and so um, hopefully the, the outcomes um, and the findings of the research will very easily kind of slip back into community um, practice and will continue, it, it, it's sort of developing a virtuous cycle almost of um, involving the community and community partners in um, in the research from the from co-creation from the point that the research idea is is developed sort of enables that research then to have the greatest impact um, and then to bring more people from the community who've experienced being part of a research project into research who can then generate the next projects and become involved in the next um, research projects that have this kind of relevance and resonance for the community so I think By turning the process on its head almost in terms of setting the research agenda with these partners and then recruiting local people to do the PhD, having um, a civic partner um, on the supervisory team for the PhD and then feeding the findings back into the community in a timely way. So not waiting four years until the PhD is finished, but having that kind of regular discussion and uh, uh, communication. Um, I think we're just we're we're at the um at the beginning of of creating a, a whole new way of doing research that really maximizes the benefits for for everyone in that process it's quite exciting yeah it's it's really exciting just to see the enthusiasm that uh people have from the PhD students to the community partners and the academics as well. Um, And another thing that this process really brings that isn't always, I guess, at the the forefront of people's minds um, is the the enrichment it brings to collaborate and work with people, especially those who are from the community, either as individuals or from organizations, and how they bring in perspectives on the same issue that you would never really think about or consider to the extent that you would in academia. So Rebecca and myself both have backgrounds as researchers. And as anyone who's done a PhD will tell you, you spend a lot of time in the minutia of very specific niche details. And while that is super necessary for research to happen and to help you get a grip with the, the problem, sometimes it may it can make it difficult for yourself as a researcher, as an academic, to take a step back and say, right, what well, how does this actually work when uh, this knowledge is applied in the real world? And that's what these people bring and uh, it enriches every level of the research process, making sure that the research that's been developed is responsive to issues that are important to people and ultimately that the outcomes of it, as Rebecca said, are useful, that they're making an impact in the real world and to make sure that they don't just lie there on a desk somewhere and gather dust. I mean, it must have been really interesting going from the start of this project for yourselves, as you're just saying, both coming from research and then advertising and getting a whole different um, group of people applying for these PhDs. Can you give me any insight into the types of different people that you're you're getting compared to what you're used to and and the excitement of what they're going to bring to these projects? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll start with that. So um, we are actually in the process of doing our recruitment now. Our very last interviews are taking place later today. And it's been really exciting to see the types of candidates come through um, that 
we we were kind of hoping would speak to us. So these are folks who um, they have maybe had some academic experience um, in the past, but the majority of their experience, their um, skills and their focus has been in recent years on community relevant work. These are people who've worked in industries such as healthcare, social work, they've worked in the charity sector, and they have hands-on experience working with some of the people affected by the issues related to the projects that they're applying for. And it's so exciting to speak to them and interview them and see the passion that comes through with them. Um, and at the same time, it's fantastic to see the uh, curiosity and the kind of research and mindset that these people have. And it's just a testament to, you know, to really drive us and keep us pushing to um, rework this uh, whole standard academic system that everyone's been used to because you can see the potential in these people and you can see how they would bring a whole new line of thought and questioning to some of these very important problems that uh, we perhaps haven't seen that much in academia. So yeah, they've come from all walks of life, a lot of local folks from local areas. Um, and very often it's people who have a very personal investment in some of these uh, project areas because they've either experienced some of the issues themselves or they've actively worked with, with the people. So yeah, it's, it's really fantastic. I think the drop-in session that you ran with colleagues um, in, at the local, what's it called, carousel in the, yes. in the city, I think that was... Um, the, the first time that I realized, so when you came back from having um, sort of run this uh, sort of open house event, really, um, taught, so people could just um, come in and find out more about what a PhD was and they could find out more about co-laboratory. Um, and it was it was in a very informal setting, but it was it was at the, 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 the center of the city. And um, I think for me, that was the first time when you came back and talked about the kind of people that had come in to find out more about co-laboratory. That was the first time I thought we're actually doing something really different here and we're making a difference. You know, even if the people who come and talk to us um, go away for five years and think no more about it, we've sown a seed um, around um, uh, just telling a story about what could be possible. And it's the art of the possible in, in the end that sort of drives people to pursue an opportunity or otherwise. And so I think what one of the things that I'm very um, uh, concerned about, I guess, is that, um, uh, that there's a there's a whole uh, community of people who could be brilliant researchers who could really drive um, change and make a difference in 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 a you know variety of areas. But for them, they don't think that a PhD is possible, and so they don't think because for whatever reason they're not on the track towards a PhD. So all of their lived experience, all of their expertise is kind of lost to the research world because they didn't tick a particular box around having had a particular um, uh, career in, 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 in education up to that point. And so when you came back from, from that day and said, we've spoken to all kinds of people who, you know, they've no idea what a PhD is, but they've heard about co-laboratory. They're really passionate about a particular um, challenge that is faced by their community. And they want to know whether they can get involved in bringing research to bear to fix some of these challenges. I thought that was amazing. And, and that was the first kind of, for me, that was the first signal that actually there's there's there could be something really significant here in in what we're doing that's that's really different, and sort of um, scratches that itch that that many of us who've worked in research and doctoral education have had for decades about who's in and who's out, and the potential that we're losing. Um, and for me, you know, we talk a lot about research excellence, but I don't think we can have research excellence if we don't have diversity in our research communities. And so trying to, in some small way, trying to make a difference in that, I think could be hugely powerful. And, and that will dr truly drive research excellence in a way that we haven't even thought of. Yeah, and that's what we're really hoping the uniqueness of co-laboratory is going to bring. So I think one thing we've not mentioned yet, which is super important, is that this is a learning process for us as well. We have we we've 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 certainly got a lot of plans and a lot of um, things in process, but we don't know what they're going to find out. We have a lot of space for change and adaptability based on what we learn from people. So, for instance, Rebecca was just talking about um, this outreach day that we did before our application process closed, where we just thought, right, let's 
uh, very often universities uh, are very good, and I speak very generally about a lot of uni all universities, really. They've been great over time to, at saying, we are open to the public, we are open to all, but they don't understand that a university could be a very intimidating place. It can be, it, there are a lot of misconceptions people have about them, and what matters is not that whether those misconceptions are true or not, it's the fact that people hold them, and it, that becomes a barrier in itself. So we thought, right, what if we take make the effort to go out of the university, we go to somewhere where people are comfortable. And with that, we started to or learn so many lessons that day where we realized there's so many people there who want to make a difference. And that is really what defines them. They have a passion for wanting to make a change and uh, benefit and, makes, and make an important impact on people's lives and the people in their communities. But they didn't think that a PhD was something that they could do. They thought, oh, academia research, uh, from what they understood of it, was a very closed off exclusionary process. And they thought, oh, for whatever reason, it's not for me. And that's really what we are hoping to change. And, and what we're hopefully starting to do is to show people who have some amazing potential, like Rebecca said, really have excellence in every sense of the word allow them to bring that into the world of research by exploring how we can break down these these barriers and open up these opportunities to them. So in a nutshell, can you tell us about the project um, and what we can expect to see sort of from the project over the next six months or so? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a very large project uh, with a lot of different elements to it, a lot of different work streams, and we've really only touched the surface uh, here today. So in total, the project is funded for the next eight years by Research England, and um, we are currently in year one. So what we'll be doing is every year for the next five years, we'll be recruiting 10 PhD students. And alongside this, we'll also be uh, recruiting local uh, members of the community to our mini placements program, which we're calling our citizen scientists program. Um, then we also have wider elements of community engagement activity coming in where it gives people an opportunity uh, for researchers and members of the community to meet, to for us to feedback about the work we're doing and get more input. And uh, there's also two other key elements and that is kind of our uh, virtual engagement approaches and um, our training, which uh, Rebecca, if you want to say a bit about that. Yeah, so um, we've got a crowdsourcing platform that we are currently developing that will be launching uh, shortly, and that will enable uh, members of the community to contribute virtually uh, to uh, some of the co-creation processes, so sharing the challenges that they're facing, their research ideas, and developing those um, as part of a, a virtual community. And I, I think we, we hope that that will um, reach perhaps younger members of the city and county, so I'm thinking about uh, school pupils or, or A-level students, um, people who are um, sort of uh, in their 20s and 30s. Um, and then we've also got uh, an exciting new development on the on the training side of things. So typically doctoral training. So that's the kind of workshops and seminars that are available um, uh, to help develop research skills. Typically, they're only available inside universities to people who are on PhD uh, uh, programs. Um, but in co-laboratory, our um, um, our training program is going to be developed so that it's open to the wider community and it will really take um, uh, uh, people from the, the very basics of research and research design all the way through um, so that those uh, opportunities will be advertised shortly also so that's another way that people can become involved in the research um, and the work that we're doing in co-laboratory. Thank you both so much for coming and telling us all about co-laboratory and what we can expect to see um, from research, perhaps, on the, in our local area over the next eight years. Thanks again. Thanks very much. You've been listening to the Research Reimagine podcast by Nottingham Trent University. For all of the latest news from the research community at NTU, follow us on Twitter at NTU underscore research or sign up to our research newsletter by visiting ntu.ac.uk forward slash research. Thanks for listening.